Hello and welcome to The Road to 2000. My name is Julian Perlico and uh, we will be looking at some of my favorite games played by uh, Robbie Kevilishvili, who, uh, who is a strong grandmaster on the, uh, on the Slew Chess team. Uh, I have no ulterior motives for looking at his games um, recently, <laughs> recently. Um, but he's, he's played some very nice games and uh, honestly he's, he's a really intimidating opponent to play. I've played him twice. Um, he just kind of puts pressure on you throughout the entire game with both white and black. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. He just gets into some very technical position and then he grinds you down. So um, we're going to look at how Robbie um, handles some, uh, some end game advantage. So in this game he played e4, black played e5, and we get to a Berlin defense and white castles uh, kingside. Um, the alternative was d3. but uh, this is the way that you can kind of by force achieve like a permanent advantage for the rest of the game. Um, this is the line where white tries to achieve two bishops. So knight e5, bishop e7 was necessary. Bishop f1 takes on e5, castles. I'm going through these moves quickly because uh, the opening is not super important. We're going to talk about how he likes to play endgames. <laughs> so knight e8, and here is the first moment where white sort of has a decision to make. So um, I'm sure that Robbie just knows this position. I mean, of course, <laughs> this is all theory. Um, but what would you guys like to do with white and why? Also, their opening is probably mostly theory. Most people's openings are mostly theory. Not when I play, but <laughs> most people. Fisher random chess says d4. Watson says b3. So we're getting a lot of d4s in chat. I think d4 is a very reasonable uh, candidate move because you are putting a pawn in the center. Um, maybe the most natural move to play in this position if you've never if you've never seen this uh, if you've never seen this before. I think b3 is a little silly because you're kind of um, tempting black to put his bishop on this diagonal anyway by having your rook on e5. What benefit does your pawn have on b3? I'm not so sure. You go away, black can play pawn. Well, okay, maybe it's smartest not to like run into some tactic, uh, but I'm not because you have your pawn on b3. Lucky me. <laughs> knight d6, knight d5, I can, I can probably take this. Um, and if you do nothing, I will go c6 and knight d6. So I don't like b3. Uh, d4 is very reasonable. There's another candidate move that, uh, that white actually played in this game. Uh, Patrick has pointed it out. So white has the option of playing knight to d5, which at first um, maybe like <laughs> a beginner wants to play this every time because it just attacks the bishop on e7. But I think when you get better, you don't really want to play knight d5 because after bishop d6, you're running into this c6 idea. And why would we give c6 with tempo? But white is playing something very specific. So after pawn to c6, um, white wants to go knight e3. And after bishop c7, well, why did we do all of this? Notice that we've played knight c3, d5, e3. <laughs> Yeah, so we want to go knight f5 with only one purpose in mind. After pawn d5, we trade our knight for the bishop. Robbie and lots of grandmasters think it's a, think, uh, think it's a good idea to waste one, two, three, four, five, six moves to trade off a knight for a bishop. That's how valuable the two bishops are. <laughs> um, but there's not really a way for black to immediately punish White's lack of development. You can get away with this a lot more with white than you can with black. If black tried to do some sort of maneuver like this, I'm sure he would, he would get smashed immediately. Um, but uh, we're going to look at this in a second. A question I had is, well, what if like black just like stops knight f5, right? So like, why is g6 a bad move? White has a really strong response to g6. What would you guys like to do here? White has close to a winning advantage. 
computer winning. Queen g4. I'm not sure what the idea of queen g4 is. I guess you want to play knight f5 anyway. Queen g4, I suppose knight g7 is a good response because I stop knight f5. When I see queen g4, I get really tempted to like just like move out of the way and then make you do this so that I line up my bishop with your queen. Um, I'm not sure if that wins or if it's even good for me. So I'll say if you, I'll say on queen g4, I'll probably play knight g7. So there's a reason why people play the move bishop to c7. It's because they want to stop white from doing this thing that he's about to do. What's up, Eddie? Don't all shout out at once. <laughs> Knight to c4. Uh, and if I just move my bishop? Side and you got all the weak uh, dark squares on the on the king side. So I I do something like you know. So uh, like d d four sure okay let's let's say I pass because I want to trick you. <laughs> what do you want to do here? Don't be scared. <laughs> A6 is ridiculous. Nobody would ever play A6 or consider it. But, but, probably you wanted to go here, right? But now. Yeah, except the thing is that you got knight to g7 now. No, no, no. After bishop h6, I promise you I won't play knight g7. No. Okay, black to play. What would you guys do with black? Oh. Yeah. That's attacked. That's attacked. So it's over. So I don't think that it's a good idea to try to exploit the dark squares in this way. Um, people were saying maybe knight g4 h6 is an idea. But even if you get your knight to h6, right, like I go to bishop here, um, it's not super clear how you're going to exploit the dark squares on the queen side. You put your knight on g4, I might just take it. Um, yeah, and you're, you'd really like to put your bishop on h6, but it's. Uh, difficult to do so, and maybe black is even getting his pieces out. So what is the big idea for white? The only thing I can think of is to get the bishop to e2, or sorry, b2. But if you play the move b3, they'll beat you to it. They go bishop e5, and who controls what diagonal? White can obtain a permanent positional advantage. That the computer evaluates as winning, I assume in human play, white's just better. Or like close to winning. I'll give you a hint. In the line that we'll look at in the game, white goes knight f5, right? And then black plays d5 here, right? Because black wants to put all his pawns on light squares knowing that he's going to lose his dark square bishop. But also, it's good to put your pawn on d5 because it gives you space. But white can do something here, like black needs to move his bishop because white can, white can advance in the center. So what to do? Ah. Uh, OK, so people now in chat are saying d4, d5. Yeah, d4, d5 is correct. d4, you can move your bishop away. d5, you will not be able to put your, your pawn on d5. And your position is really, really bad here. 
Um, you're going to have to put your pawn on d6, which makes all your pieces bad. Um, you can't take this pawn ever because you will have, a, you know, an isolated d pawn and the knight on d5 is a monster. This position is positionally very suspect for black. So that is why black, instead of, you know, playing a random move, moves his bishop either to e7 or to c7. I tried understanding why bishop e7 was worse than bishop c7. Um, I actually don't really know why people in the database go like c4 and they get this position. Um, and I guess it's a little easier to play white because the rook is attacking the bishop and your pieces are a little better. But realistically, this, this position doesn't seem like a whole lot for white either. So maybe this is just a different way to play. Um, in any case, Mark played the move bishop c7 and we get knight f5 in this position where white has two bishops. Okay. This is another decision point in the game where you're going to have to come up with a plan. So what do you want to do with your pieces? What do you want to do with your pawns? Why do I have seven pawns on their start squares? <laughs> because we played knight c3, d5, e3, f5, e7, c8, and that was a lot of turns. So if we had you know, pawns further up the board, that would be cheating. <sighs> he asked a question, I, I gave him an answer, you know. No light squared bishop, so rook h3 is an idea. OK. Um, let's say we teleport your rook to h3. What do you want to do from there, and why are you better? I think the big question, like the main question here, um, is do we put our pawn on d4? Or do we put our pawn on d3, and why? I think we put it on d4 so that we can give the d3 square to the bishop. OK. It's a thought. d4 to give the d3 square to the bishop. That is definitely a positive. <laughs> I'm sorry, Twitch. Ugh. The good thing about Twitch chat tonight is I know they're not cheating. <laughs> like some of the moves I see here, oh my god. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna call anybody out. That was that was funny though. <laughs> um, so pawn to d4 to give d th the d3 squared to the bishop. Um, do you see any downside of putting your pawn on d4, or is it only positive? It's easier to attack. Um, maybe, like bishop b6, for instance. Although I don't think that's actually a concern, because when I play c3, it's not like the structure is like weak, right? Well, the other thing about putting the pawn on, the, on, the, uh, on d4 is simply block the a1 diagonal. Sure. Um, so in general, when you're playing with two bishops, right? So Robbie, Robbie's whole goal when he plays openings like this, and he plays a lot of openings that are exactly like this, where he tries to get some like small advantage and like press you forever. Um, you want to play like very flexible chess where um, the structure is fluid and you can adapt to whatever your opponent is doing. So um, believe it or not, pawn d4 is kind of a, like a small positional mistake because you're defining the structure before the structure needs to be defined. If I put my pawn on d3, in future positions I can choose whether or not I want to play the move pawn to c4, which I very well might want to do. Uh, or I can play d4 later. There's, there's absolutely no rush. It is not the style of position where um, things need to be done immediately, right? So patient play is going to be rewarded, and Robbie in the game decided to play pawn d3. You just want to have your structure be fluid and dynamic. You don't want to define anything, because two bishops work well with dynamic structures. They don't work so well with static structures. Static structures, that's generally where um, knights are preferred. Um, OK, so that's why d3 is played. 
Queen to d7 is, is played here. Now, obviously, the downside of d3, as you indicated, you wanted the d3 square for your bishop. We made our bishop worse. So it makes sense. Uh, OK, sorry. He played queen f3 here. Um, but in the future, we are going to develop our bishop this way, because this diagonal is no longer as useful to our light square bishop. OK, queen f3, bishop d2, uh, just completing development. The rooks are now connected. Um, rook c e8. And then Robbie here plays another like really nice positional move. I see this a lot in exchange French positions, like this exact idea, because or normally the pawns on d4 in those cases, but the idea still applies against this structure. Is c4 possible now? Uh, mm, uh, <laughs> this bishop's hanging on d2. I'm not saying it's not possible, but you have to tell me why this doesn't work. I'm too lazy to calculate by myself. Maybe like you just win. Yeah, you, like you just win here. So you beat me. You beat me. Who cares? I guess I go back. I don't know. Is black losing here? If black's not losing, then you've made a mistake. Um, also, if you play c4, it's not really in the spirit of the position because you're defining the structure already. So maybe I can like take and just say things are kind of symmetrical. Maybe I go knight f5 to d4. Those are my, my two thoughts about c4. That's if I were like willing to calculate, <laughs> which I would never do. <clears throat> I aim to emulate one node Leela. One node Leela is like 2,400 strength, and it literally sees one node ahead, you know, like one like half move ahead. That's how I want to play chess. <laughs> I don't ever want to see anything. I just want to play the best moves. Bishop c3 or bishop b4. OK, I'll give you a hint. This is going to be like a, a white is going to change the structure in some way. Not like a major way, but just like a nice um, uh, space gaining way. Just shout out. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, my th there's a light here. So I <laughs> I like flat out cannot see anything back there. I can see you. I can kind of see you. <laughs> so, I'm basically blind. That's so yeah, a4 is very strong. Now, the reason why a4 is good is, um, one, uh, if black plays the move a5 to stop you from going a5 yourself, we have um, made this bishop tethered to this pawn for the rest of the game. This is going to be a weakness. Secondly, at any moment, we could play a5. In response to a6, for instance, a5 might be useful. You can imagine one day my bishop goes to c8 and you lose. That's a long way in the future. But a4 is going to be a generally useful move in every endgame. And again, the way Robbie likes to beat people is <laughs> he gets some very slight advantage, and then he just beats them in a technical endgame. So a4 is very nice. Uh, black traded on e1 and played rook to e8. I actually think this isn't super stiff resistance, because white kind of wants to trade pieces anyway. Um, but OK, white traded on e8. And then again, OK, we need to improve our pieces. So pawn to g3 makes sense. Queen to e6, and um, I like Robbie's maneuver here a lot, so I will let you guys find it. White to play, how would you like to play with your pieces? 
I'll give you a hint. This piece is not good on this square. <laughs> Twitch chat, chat. Uh, so uh, says it right away. I'll give the in-house audience like two minutes to, to catch up maybe. Twitch chat learned from the previous move. It's like, what's a good move that's random? Oh, that one. OK. <laughs> it's the analogous move. H4. H4, of course. You got to push your rook pawns in chess. A4 and H4. Now, what's the idea? Why is that move good? It's a question to everybody. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So in, what we would like to do is we want to go king h2 and improve our light square bishop. The bishop on h3 is not a bad piece. Bishop on h3 might be the best piece on the board. right? So OK, uh, h4, king g8, black decides to make his king a little bit better. The king is um, going to be uh, worse on h8 in, well, in every position. In middle games, you might get back rank checkmated. And in end games, the king is further away from the center. Pawn to c3, and then here, king to h2. Queen f5, take, take. Bishop h3, of course. Uh, all of these moves were you know, in line with our plan. Black plays the move knight to e7. Um, your pawn on f2 is attacked. What do you guys want to do about it? <laughs> it's all about Robbie. I always want to highlight Robbie in any <laughs> in any instant <laughs> instance. Yeah. Always repeat the king g g1. Man. Well, okay. Robbie played king g2. <laughs> don't don't. Okay. This this gives me bad vibe. Uh, your move's fine. Like obviously, king g2 defending your f pawn is fine. One thing you don't want to do is you don't want to push your f pawn. If you push your f pawn. Like f4 is a very serious positional mistake. I was teaching some children earlier, and they were very happy about this move. But f5, and it's going to be uh, very difficult for you to win the game after I set up my pawns like that. Um, now here's what's funny. Robbie played king g2 in the game, uh, but um, okay, king g2 is fine. I I'll make you find this move, then we'll go back. So what would you do with white here, and why? Bishop d5 is illegal and bad. Don't do that. Bishop, uh, bishop d7. <laughs> bishop d7. Yeah, bishop d7 is really good because um, black in this position has threatened to play the move f5. You couldn't play f5 here because somebody will tell me why. Bishop g5. The knight's attacked. Pawn on f5 is attacked. Uh, bishop d8, I have the option of playing an opposite color bishop endgame or just taking your pawn on f5 because of you know tactics. Either way, uh, white has really good winning chances here. The opposite color bishop endgame, you also have really good winning chances because the pawn on h7 is attacked. If you you can't move your cane, uh, if you do move, if, if you move this, then I'll go here, or I'll go there, and I'll take your d5 pawn. Being up two pawns is pretty good, generally speaking. So after king f8, bishop d7. Um, is necessary because now that the knight on e7 is defended, if you play some random move, f5, bishop g5, g6, you're, you're not really getting into black's position, right? So bishop d7 is a really good move. OK, so now that I've said that, in this position, king g2 actually wasn't necessary. When I was looking at this game, I was very surprised he played king g2. Um, I thought he would play bishop d7 here. So just as like a small tactic, what I, I, I like kind of tricked you. I was like, f2 is attacked. So what should you do about it? But what happens after bishop f2? Yeah, d4 and it's over. I mean, you just go king g2. 
So I was more afraid of F5 than I was of the F2 being a pawn being ha F2 pawn hanging. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, Robbie is a grandmaster, and he doesn't want to like think in these end games. So why would you, <laughs> why would you do anything concrete? You just play king g2, bishop d7, and you improve all your pieces. Now, already here, black's position is very, very, very difficult. Um, he played the move f5. Um, for better or for worse. I'm actually not sure if this was... It, probably it's necessary, because if you don't play the move f5, um, how are you going to get your king this way? If you move your knight, then white wins with bishop c8, right? Pawn up b7 is trapped. So you have to play f5 if you want to get your king closer to the center. Um, what would you guys like to do with white? <laughs> Patrick Daly says, don't think this is my school of chess. Have you seen my games? <laughs> this is what excites me. I'm so sorry you saw Talia's lecture where she like checkmated everybody and then she showed like Morphe games where like Morphe beat everybody mercilessly. I don't care about any of that. I've never checkmated anybody in my life. I've never been checkmated. I lose positionally, I win positionally. That's how it goes. That's what chess is all about. <laughs> If you're having fun playing chess, you're playing chess incorrectly. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm still, I'm still uh, looking at uh, bishop to g5. Bishop to g5 is a good move. Um, with the same idea, he played the move bishop f4. Uh, the reason he prefers the f4 square over g5 uh, is when you play the move bishop d6, you are also like taking away future squares from the opponent's king. And when you go bishop g5, maybe black can kick you away with h6 and like go king f6, g5, like real real fast. Um, it's just a safer way to play. Now, with that said, bishop g5 is also a good move, um, I think. Uh, OK, he played king f7, bishop d6. Uh, you just want to like tag your opponent's pieces, right? Uh, the knight on e7 is, is attacked once, it's defended once. This can only be a good relationship for us. This is a bad relationship for black. So black, um, okay, black can't really do anything about it right now. He plays the move pawn g6. It's also convenient for us that this knight is trapped. Again, you can't move because bishop c8 and I like win. Um, okay, uh, king f1. He's not rushing to do anything. Again, in these end games, you just want to stay flexible. You want to maximize your position before you even think about a pawn break. So maybe he doesn't know exactly the best square to put his king on. I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe he did. Um, but he just wants to play around uh, around a bit until he finds the best squares for his pieces. So, oh, whoa, nobody saw that. <laughs> uh, okay, so all the all the maneuvering. Okay, we get to the end game, and finally he's bringing his king. Okay, so after Black plays the move pawn to a5, he now chooses to play the move pawn to d4 because um, he wants to take away squares from this bishop. And um, okay, you don't have to deal with f2 being a problem. I might bring my king to d3. Uh, this structural change finally makes sense as soon as our pieces have been activated to their full potential. Uh, by the way, had black played with a different structure, we would not have put our pawn on d4. Like imagine the bishop were on g2 and then black chose to play like c, c5 at some point, then playing d4 doesn't make any sense. We'll keep the d5 pawn as a weakness. And there are Maybe we'll get to a game where, where that happens. Um, OK, but d4 makes sense here because we are increasing our space and giving a, a, a square to our king. OK, bishop d8, king e2. OK, again, he puts his king on d3. Uh, OK, he plays king e3. I think he, you know, you're not really in any rush. I'm not sure what the time situation was. You don't want to do anything unless you can actually like uh, calculate it to, to a win. Um, okay, Mark, Mark decided to play h6. He uh, chose this moment. I guess he was afraid in the future that this king might end up on the h6 square. That would be dangerous. So for instance, if you you know, wait around for, for a bit, okay, um, maybe you probably don't want to do it when there's some discovery. Like king g5, knight c8 might, would be a really bad way to lose this game. It's like how I would lose. <laughs> um, but bishop b6, king g5, and then like king h6. Oh wait, actually you lose here too. Never mind. Like, this is how you lose. It's how I would lose. Uh, 
Yeah, never mind. But I, I, I actually don't know why he played h6, but I imagine he was afraid of the king coming to g5 at some point. Um, also, maybe at some point he can play g5, which he did later in this game. OK, so sorry, where were we? He played h6, bishop f4. OK, let's say you're playing black. This is very unpleasant. But I force you to defend this position because I'm sadistic. What do you want to do and why? Your h6 pawn is hanging, and I will take it if you don't move it or you know defend it. Joshua Postuma was there. He saw it. Mark got bishop paired. True. Very true. Josh is also a big fan of beating people this way. I have no motives for looking <laughs> at uh, Robbie Kevishvili's games. I'm just a big fan. Big fan. King g8 does not defend the h6 pawn. <laughs> king g8. That makes your king worse and h6 hangs. I take it. Even if you could play knight takes f5 here, I would play bishop takes f5. Your opponent plays knight takes f5 here, you let them. That's my advice. No, I wouldn't call anybody. I would let them play knight f5. I would take their knight so fast and the game would keep going. If your opponent cheats and is good for you, let them cheat. That's my advice. <laughs> you can't resign. Okay, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Listen, um, chess is all about playing bad positions. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, what are you going to do? Because, you know, if you play uh, knight to g8, uh, then you got. Yeah, knight g8, knight g8, bishop c8 is going to be really rough. b6, bishop b7. Yeah. Actually, maybe here you even have knight e7, but no, no, no. It, it should collapse. Bishop here, I'll take everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, bad things will happen to you, I agree. Also, maybe this is stronger. Who knows? Uh, the real question is, do you want to defend this pawn, or do you want to push this pawn? That's the well, real question I'm asking. Um, I actually think it's the opposite. You play the move pawn to h5. You are weakening this of uh, the dark squares permanently. You've also fixed all of your pawns on light squares, which is super convenient for me, because I have a light square bishop, and you don't. Right? So even if you somehow magically manage to defend your queen side, I'll take all those queen side pawns. So this is going to end up really bad for you. Bishop g5, for instance, already causes uh, immediate distress. Might come this way and just, oh, well, if I put my king on e5, you'll checkmate me. But if I you know, play smarter, maybe I won't get checkmated. <laughs> all right, so h6 was played, bishop f4. Mark decided to play king to g7, which I think is good defense. Bishop e5, and then um, you improve your king with king f4. Bishop to b6, pawn f3. He's just getting his pawn off of the f2 square. Bishop to d8, and uh, pawn, to, pawn to b3. So um, pushing these pawns doesn't really change anything. Uh, you're just getting them off of the dark squares. Uh, he can play b4 later, he can play c4 later, he can play g4 later. These are all options. He's keeping his options open until uh, he again has like maximized, um, maximized his peace activity. So bishop to uh, b6, he decides to bring his king the, uh, the other way. OK, I should have made you, <laughs> made you do this decision. After g5, he plays a really nice move again. Pawn to h5. As the defensive side, you want to trade pawns. As the attacking side, you want to keep as many pawns on the board as possible, because more likely your opponent will have weaknesses. After pawn to h5, we have eliminated the g6 square from the knight, and also h6 is a permanent weakness. This king can no longer leave these squares. If this king, by those squares I mean these squares, because I'll play bishop g7 and I'll take your h6 pawn. King cannot be anywhere else. Um, and that's really bad because a bunch of your pieces have become tied to very specific locations on the board. The knight cannot be anywhere but e7. I will play bishop c8 and win your queen side. King cannot be anywhere but the king side because I'll play bishop g7 and win your king side. So black, uh, black probably sh just sh should sit. 
sit, maybe at some point try to play c5. That's, that's what you do. You just have to like kind of pray. You have to time c5 in, in a good way and hope that you can get rid of your queen side weaknesses. Um, and you're still going to be like worse for the rest of the game. And you know, if you're in time pressure and your opponent's not, you're, you're probably going to lose. Maybe you'll lose no matter what. But it's better than, um, than giving your opponent additional weaknesses to target. So now after g5, h5, um, white, I think, is objectively winning. Bishop wow. to d8. Sorry? G5 yeah. at what stage? Here? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. Why not G5 here? Right. Uh, if I just take it twice, do you have some discovery that kills me? I was thinking knight to uh, G6. If I take this. I yeah, af after you take, I have three connected pass pawns. You know, opposite bishops does create additional drawing chances, but three pass pawns is too much, right? Yeah. Yeah, and this is also going to fall. Yeah, I think just concretely, you can never achieve G5. So bishop e5 is check, right? And then king f4 stops g5. So that's why. Okay. That's a good question, obviously. So pawn to g5, pawn h5. Bishop d8, he goes king d3. He is just trying to uh, maximize his pieces. Plays bishop b6. OK. White to play. What do you want to do with white and why? Okay, Twitch chat. Twitch chat says c4, which is a pawn break. I'm basically asking you what pawn break you want to play and why. That's why we've paused here. White has made all of, all of white's pieces are pretty good. The bishop on e5 is on a really nice square, making sure g7 is touched. The bishop on d7 is really nice because you can go to c8, um, making sure the knight can't move. King is nice on d3, protecting you know important squares. So what pawn break do you want to play? Somebody says c4, somebody says g4. Somebody says b4. If you say f4, we've covered all the pawn moves. <laughs> uh, somebody says f4. Oh, oops. I apologize to headphone users everywhere. Um, OK, so instead of just saying one move, can you tell me the move and then tell me why you want to play that move? <laughs> How are you going to do that? So b4, how do you make an outside pass pawn? Well, I'm on my way. <laughs> Nate says, give it time. Give it time. It'll happen. Don't worry. <laughs> no, but like, OK, every pawn move is, go is, is, a, is a pretty major decision, right? So I'm not saying b4 is wrong. Oh, could be wrong. Um, but one thing's for sure, b4 does not help you make an outside pass pawn, right? You're not really threatening anything. I mean, b5, I guess. But after b5, probably black goes c5 or something. Something to this effect. b4, a, b, c, b, a5. Who, is, who are you playing that just takes on b4? I want to play your opponents. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so one problem that we have uh, for break, so eventually we're going to need a breakthrough, right? If we don't manage to create a pass pawn or give our king entry squares, we just don't win because um, black click kind of has a fortress, right? Um, so I agree, we, w we want to try to generate a pass pawn, but also we want to limit our opponent's activity. We want to take as many squares away from his pieces as possible, Karpov style. Uh, 
Ah, okay, sorry. Fisher random chess got it. What, what are you going to say? Well, what, what, <laughs> priority to in-house audience. I don't care about them. Um, I would just say um, C4. With the idea of doing what next? With the idea of, um, with the idea of C4. That's correct. C4 with the idea if black does nothing, like let's say bishop d8 and you wait, after c5, the bishop on d8 has zero squares. Eventually, um, eventually we can play like Nate uh, and maybe play b4, b5. If they take, we can go a5. And um, also, in some positions, maybe I will give my bishop and take, uh, take this pawn at a time when I have an outside pass pawn. Right. I won't do that like in the current position as it is, but when I have b4, a, b, king, b4 on the board, then when bishop d6, e7 happens, and I take b7, this a pawn will just win the game. So that's a big problem that black has to face. And note that the h6 pawn is going to be very important in those end games because eventually king g6 can't defend. I'm going to need to have pieces over there. Um, black decided in the game to take on c4, and I take back. But what's the problem for black with this structural change? There's something really, really bad happened to black. Something good happened to white. As you can hear outside, the entire block is the chess club, comes to the chess club, entire Euclid block. St. Louis Chess Club, <laughs> advertising from outside. We don't script these things. <laughs> yeah, potential pass pawn. So in the previous position, couldn't make a pass pawn. After C, C takes, oh, sorry, D takes C4, B takes C4, D5, in the future, okay, right now it's defended twice, but this is a structural change that realistically can happen, right? If I play d5, I'm getting a pass pawn. That pass pawn might die immediately, but I have a pass pawn. So, bishop to d8. Now, with that in mind, what would you like to do here with white? Thank you, Addy. Try to be a man of class. <laughs> Bishop to d6. Bishop to d6. Bishop to d6 is okay. I'm sure that's a fine move. But actually, um, the bishop on e5 is protected, and again, like touching the g7 square is useful. Um, the thing that we want to achieve is d5. Can't play d5 right now because it blunders a pawn. But if it didn't blunder upon, that would be good for us. Some guy says bishop d6. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Twitch chat has got it. I'll give you guys a few, a few minutes. Yeah, g4. With the idea? Oh, well, sorry, he played king e3 first because he doesn't rush. I want to play g4. Bishop b6, now g4. And what's what's the point? So if he plays uh, f, uh, f4, then uh, you've, got the, uh, you've got the e4. Yeah, so essentially, no matter what trade in the game, we're going to be able to play king e4. And d5 is coming. This is going to be really, really rough for, for black to defend now. Um, as I said, a long time ago, white was already objectively winning. But I think uh, play becomes like very standard from here. So for instance, you guys would play king e4 now. Um, after knight g8, OK, uh, what do you do? Aha. Uh -huh. So d5 wins, probably. But it does allow knight f6 to transition to a different like kind of endgame. So yeah, you just want to keep your bishops. Keep everything the way it is. You meant you when I was an STL once for this uh, Sinkfield Cup? I don't know what you, uh, I, presumably he means he met me. If he means me, this is a different, different thing altogether. 
What does it mean to mean somebody? Yeah, bishop c8 just attack the b7 pawn, seven pawn moves, and now he plays d5, right? Now that there's no fear of him losing his bishop somehow. Um, yeah, so takes, takes. Uh, knight f6 is played here. What do you guys want to do? Trade your bishop for that knight? <laughs> Who wants to trade their bishop for the knight? I know I do. <laughs> Yeah, no, don't don't trade your bishop for the knight. <laughs> Trading the bishop for the knight would make your winning task much, much, much more difficult. Yeah. Okay, so Twitch chat and you want to play king to d4 because you just defend the d5 pawn, but you you actually have a better move. Yeah, king f5. And if knight d5? Uh, then you just flip the king and then Boom. Over. Game over. So the knight can't take the d5 pawn, so king f5 is awful and convenient to deal with. Okay. Black played bishop e7. Ooh. And Ouch. black's about to resign. D6. Uh, he might have played that. No, he played bishop e6 first, and then he played d6. What do you want to do? Bishop to a1 was played, which is the same as bishop d4, and black resigned, which maybe is not too surprising. This is just Zugzwalm. This knight legally can't move due to the rules of the game. If you move your king, I will take your knight. If you move your bishop, I'll take your bishop. If you move your pawn, I'll take your pawn. If you move your bishop, I'll take your knight. No moves. No moves can be played without material loss. Isn't this like a nice final image? Bishop to a1 is Bishop a1 is good because it sets up for the next game in chess 960. <laughs> yeah, that's it. No more, no more moves. Um, so, just to go back through the game really fast, uh, White played this um, this opening where you get like a small edge and you just kind of play forever. Uh, you have the two bishops, Black. Black's compensation for the two bishops is his lead in development and extra space. His space advantage doesn't matter because white can, first of all, claim his space back immediately if he wants to. He doesn't even want to. We saw that white played d3 in the game. And secondly, um, a development advantage is a temporary advantage. Let's be very clear. When you say, I have a development advantage, you need to exchange that advantage for something else or it's not a real advantage. That's how development advantages work. And black here cannot exchange his development advantage for absolutely anything, so he will be worse permanently for the rest of the game. Um, so pawn to d3 is good. Again, if black tried to play d4 or something earlier, then the way white would combat this would be playing something like g3, bishop, g2, like play on the queen side or something, try to you know, use the bishop on this diagonal now. Um, the way that it happened in the game, uh, Robbie played a few very nice positional moves. He played the move pawn to a4, uh, which I really like because against the structure, having the option of playing a5 is always nice. And um, provoking your opponent to play a5, uh, where we saw, I mean, the a5 pawn, the bishop was tethered to this diagonal basically the entire game because it had to defend the a5 pawn. Um, so a4, very nice positional move. Trading the rooks, uh, you might think, well, we're liquidating all the pieces, black is in you know, not a lot of danger, but with some very precise moves, g3, and then this h4, king, h2, bishop, h3 plan is very nice. Um, white activates all his pieces and uh, um, is, just, uh, is just better basically for free. Um, bishop d7 being a nice touch. And uh, the, last, the last touch after he activates his pieces from a pawn break perspective, once black puts his pawn on a5, fixing the structure, we play d4 to go. Uh, to put the king on d3, and now, um, okay, this was just some maneuvering. The main point is that we want to play c4 and c5 to eliminate um, black's activity. Sorry, after g5, it, it's, we, we sort of skimmed over this uh, during 
during in class, but h5 is important because you want to take away the g6 square from the knight. And also, in general, when you're attacking in these like slightly better endgames, you don't want to trade pawns. You want to keep as many pawns on the board as possible. So bishop d8, king d3, and then c4, c5 um, was the idea, trying to take away as many of black's legal moves as possible. And once the structural change happened, because c5 was such a good idea, um, white now has the ability to generate a pass pawn. And the game kind of just ended like quickly, right? Every move that white played made progress from this on. There's no more maneuvering. Well, he played like one more maneuvering move, king e3. But after that, it's just progress, 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 g4, progress, king e4, progress. I, I put my bishop on c8 to avoid, you know, knight forks, although probably it wasn't even necessary. Um, b6, d5, and the, like he resigned three moves from now. Bishop b6, d6, bishop a1, and that is game over. Um, I don't think we have time to go over uh, more of Robbie's games, but um, this is something that Robbie really likes to do. When he has white against you, uh, even when he has black, when he has white against you, he wants to have some small advantage that basically lasts throughout the entire game, and he wants to just play with that advantage, and he's a really, really strong technical player. Um, he's also a really strong tactical player. It turns out these grandmasters are pretty good at a lot of different types of chess. But um, his main like style, it seems, what, what I've observed, um, he likes to just beat you in some technical end game with good practical uh, moves. Do you guys have any questions? You know, I just want to say I think it'd be worth another week to go over more of this stuff. This is really, this is really good. Okay. Well, uh, thanks so much for showing up to my class. I think I'm gonna end a little, a little early just because <laughs> it probably will take another 50 minutes to talk about <laughs> one of these other games. All right. Thanks for showing up to the road to 2000.